Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Joost Blom, principal of the Emeritus College. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I would also like to acknowledge that uh, you, the members, uh, are joining us today from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Uh, please note that this event, uh, as you've already heard the little cue, uh, is being recorded for public use uh, and the recording will be posted on the college website uh, and a link will be sent to you uh, when it goes up. And that recording will include the uh, Q&A session, I believe. Um, so uh, we ha will have a short business meeting, which is really just a sort of a little string of announcements by me. Um, and then we will get the, uh, the interesting part of the, uh, the afternoon, which is the presentation by Alfred Hermida with uh, the Q&A session afterwards. So the, uh, if I can just ask for those slides to go up, right. So the, th this is just to report on uh, to you uh, on a number of the things that are, have been going on and are going on and will go on um, in the college and, uh, and activities of the council. Um, we had as the first bullet point uh, indicates um, March the 15th, uh, we had a, uh, a sort of educational session for council and for the committee members of the college on the Indigenous Strategic Plan. Well, this was an initiative uh, of our Continuing Scholarly Activity and Engagement Committee, which is chaired by Gail Bellward. And um, it, the, uh, it was an excellent session uh, and with a lot of, of uh, sort of active participation, and it is the first step in uh, that committee's um, uh, sort of uh, engaging the college with the Indigenous Strategic Plan, um, uh, and that should be a tremendous help to all of us in uh, becoming better informed about uh, Indigenous issues that affect the, what the college does and might do. Um, and uh, we're very much looking forward to being part of it. Um, the uh, second bullet point is a, a sort of a steady feature of my uh, public appeals on the newsletter and here, um, which is uh, we're always looking for volunteers uh, to serve on uh, college committees uh, and to, and in this case, I, I, there's a particular mention of the newsletter editorship, which uh, Marjorie Fee, who is the uh, current editor, um, is sort of reaching the, in June, reaches the end of her, the term that she, uh, when she, that she undertook. And so we are looking for a new editor to take over from her and I encourage anyone uh, who has an interest or know of somebody who might have an interest uh, to take on that uh, challenge. It's interesting and, and enjoyable, I think, and um, but extremely valuable too for all the members. The newsletter really is one of our, the keys to co communicating with our members. And uh, so it's a very important as well as enjoyable, I think, uh, job to have. Um, next uh, is uh, that I want to remind you now that from now until the end of the bullet points, um, all of the events that I mentioned are on the college website. So uh, further details are available there. And, on the, I don't want the next slide just yet, but uh, the, uh, the website uh, URL is there. The First of all, on May the 4th, we have the college's annual general meeting, uh, 
one of the purposes of which is to uh, elect the new council uh, for uh, 2022-23. Um, just uh, the, actual, the actual election precedes the meeting. Um, so the, there is, as the slide indicates, uh, a slate produced by the college's nominating committee um, and uh, the council has approved that uh, set of candidates. So there are there is a candidate for every position. It's exciting. Um, but in but in terms of but there are you are free to nominate others for those positions. Oh, and, see. <laughs> and so uh, the um, there is a, will be uh, in April a call for those those nominations and if necessary uh, an election will be held online uh, but in advance of the actual annual general meeting on the 4th of May. If we could now have the next slide, uh, please. Thanks. Um, so just some of the other upcoming events. Um, on the March the 30th, uh, there will be a College Conversations online session, a uh, very interesting uh, set of speakers, Brian Job, Pittman Potter, and Peter Sudfeld, uh, all of whom I think virtually everybody listening right now will know. Um, and they will be talking about features of a post-pandemic society. Uh, so what that's on the, the March the 30th, two in the afternoon. Um, on uh, two things happening on Tuesday, April the 12th, in the morning at 10, there is a, a, a and again, online, an engagement session with uh, for the campus 2050 um, plan. Now, this is a, a plan on the uh, development, basically, of the campus, the evolution of the campus uh, in the next uh, while, uh, up to 2050. And uh, so the engagement team from the Campus 2050 group uh, is inviting all Emeritus College members to share their input on the future of UBC. And so there'll be a presentation to learn about the campus uh, vision uh, 2050 and then to participate by asking questions and providing uh, your insights into key topics. Uh, later that day at five, uh, on the 12th, Tuesday, the 12th of April, uh, the last in the very uh, excellent series that we've held jointly with Green College on intergenerational trauma. Um, and um, the, uh, it concludes with this uh, unique uh, live, this is actually an in-person event at the old auditorium, um, an integrated presentation on how music and performance can contextualize injury and recovery from war, uh, war-related trauma among veterans and their families. And this will involve a musical performance developed and directed by Nancy Hermiston, uh, including music students and veteran uh, st students who are veterans participate performing the uh, famous sleep chorus from Silent Night, which is an opera depicting the famous Christmas truce of World War I. Um, then, uh, so that, that will be at 5 p.m. in the old auditorium on Tuesday, uh, April the 12th. Uh, I've mentioned the annual general meeting. The speaker at the annual general meeting will be David Wilkinson, uh, and he is going to be talking uh, about clean energy. And then uh, the last thing I want to mention is the uh, CURAC conference. Now, the CURAC is the, uh, the you know, the colleges and universities, retirees, uh, associations of Canada. So it's the umbrella organization of which we uh, and other retiree associations are members. Um, and it does a lot of, of very good work to advance the interests of all, all of these retiree associations across the country. Um, and we were to host an in-person conference uh, in May at this, on, at this time, 
but back in the fall, it, we weren't sure that we could have it. And in fact, it's even now uh, uh, not all that reliable uh, to schedule in-person conferences in May. So um, the, uh, it was changed to a one day virtual conference. And the theme of it is, uh, as you see there, faces of wellness and well-being as we grow older. And there, that is a fairly extensive uh, session. There is a uh, starts at 930, will run uh, to, uh, I think, 1, 1.30 in the afternoon with a break. Um, but there will be an, an hour long session by John Helliwell, uh, a, an, a film, uh, the video of the Curac Tribute Awards um, uh, to uh, members of retiree associations for their contributions, and then a second session uh, panel discussion um, uh, in, involving uh, three speakers, which I, I, I won't get into in detail, but that'll be an extremely worthwhile session to, uh, to participate or to, to watch and to participate in. So I encourage you to mark your uh, sort of calendar for uh, 9.30 on Thursday, May the 19th. That uh, concludes, I think, what I have to say for today. Um, so uh, I will now uh, turn things over to Sandra Bressler, who is going to introduce the speaker for us. Good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce you to Alfred Hermida. Alfred is an award-winning online news pioneer, media scholar, and journalism educator. With more than two decades of experience in digital journalism, his research addresses the transformation of news, media innovation, social media, and data journalism. He is a professor at the University of British Columbia School of Journalism, Writing and Media, where he served as director for five years. He is also co-lead of the Shirk-funded Global Journalism Innovation Lab, which examines how new revenue models, new policy frameworks, and new modes of audience engagement can support informed knowledge-based journalism, which is so timely. He also co-founded the Conversation Canada in 2017. He was a BBC journalist for 16 years, including four in North Africa and the Middle East, before going to be a founding news editor of the BBC News website in 1997. So it is a pleasure to introduce him to you today. He, uh, just a reminder about his topic, he is going to discuss with us how the future of journalism is being shaped uh, by approaches to journalism, innovation, practices, business models, and policy framework. And I forgot to add one bit of information, which I think is really timely. Uh, those of you may know that Stanford University has recently published a list representing the top 2% of the world's most cited scientists in various disciplines, with many UBC language scientist members being recognized, and it includes Alfred. So it is my pleasure, pleasure to have Alfred speak to us this afternoon. There will be a, a question and answer period after his talk. And uh, if you could put, submit your questions to the chat line, I will be able to share that with everybody. So Alfred, to you. Thank you for the generous introduction. And thank you to inviting me to be part of this meeting. It's a pleasure to be here to talk on this topic of the future of journalism. It's something that has really always been a focus of both my professional work and my academic work, and more recently under the auspices of the Global Journalism Innovation Lab, really working with my colleague at UBC, Marilyn Young, looking particularly at the state of journalism in Canada. And that's really what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about some of the challenges facing journalism, some of the signs you're seeing that of persistence and resilience, 
And then really focus on what is happening in terms of renewing the type of journalism that we're seeing here in Canada. Very often, the story of journalism tends to be one of decline, of job losses, of shrinkages, of cuts. But there are also signs of people, of journalists, of editors, of funders, who are trying to create a more responsive and a more inclusive, more representative form of journalism. Before we get there, we'll start with COVID, since we're still only two years into this pandemic. And from all I'm reading, this is not going to go away tomorrow, but we'll continue. And what we saw at the start of the crisis, as with so many other things, when a pandemic was declared globally, headlines like this in the, in the Ottawa Sun, and then discourses around the impact it was going to have on the media in Canada. Um, this coming at a time where commercial media in particular was showing sharp declines, especially within the print sector, facing falling circulation, loss of advertising, decline in readerships and increased competition. COVID was one of the latest shocks to the system obviously not just to media, but across other parts of Canadian economy and society. The specific impact of the pandemic on the media in Canada was being tracked by a project at Ryerson School of Journalism called the Local News Research Project. And they were looking at what happened since March 2020. So over the last couple of years, what has been the impact of the pandemic? And Hardly surprising, we see a significant impact here, particularly in terms of the local level. So out of the 40, 53 news outlets that were closed permanently, 41 of those were community newspapers. So we're seeing this impact very much at a local level. When we look at the outlets that cancel some or all of their print editions, again, largely happening at the local level, at the community level. And then we also see Outlets, 183 reporting job losses, more than 3,000 editorial and non-editorial jobs cut, and out of those, 1,200 that have permanently gone. So certainly the last two years has been very challenging for journalism at a time when the need for informed, evidence-based reporting and analysis is even more pressing. Of course, there was help from the government both in terms of the COVID wage subsidies um, and in terms of other subsidies for media. What happened there, as with in other industries, particularly the wage subsidies benefited the larger media players because the larger media players, such as the post media group of newspapers, would benefit simply because of their size. So post media, for example, received more than $60 million in COVID relief in 2020 and 2021, while at the same time trying to keep up its profit margins and pay its executive bonuses. So we certainly see the story in commercial media of decline while at the same time of trying to keep up those profit margins because of the commercial imperative to make money. But I want to take us beyond a discussion of the, of the crisis in journalism as purely economic. Um, Really, when we think about crisis, it really depends on how we define the actual term. And very much what you see in discourses in journalism, it's essentially thought of as an economic crisis. And we have this pervasive narrative of a crisis in journalism. That crisis is largely located in a loss of revenue, um, and a loss of revenue, especially in the newspaper industry. The newspaper industry was a remarkable source of profit. Newspapers could count on between 20 and 30% profit margins on their products, which is astonishing by any economic measures. So when we have the crisis narrative, we're really talking about declining profits for print and largely located in an Anglo-American narrative, the US, Canada, UK, Australia largely liberal, well-developed commercial media systems. And in Canada, historically in Canada, the majority of media has been commercial and for-profit. 
So this narrative then gets repeated by industry because if you're a newspaper owner, it serves your interest to talk about how Google is stealing your advertising, how Facebook is stealing your advertising, how Google and Facebook are, quotes, stealing their news. It's in your interest to say there is an economic crisis and others are to blame so that you can keep up your profit margins. You know, this crisis is not defined in terms of what are the, the needs of our citizens. It's not defined by how can we do better journalism. It's defined by we're losing money. We need money from Google, from government to help us keep up our profit margins. You then get it from journalists themselves because they are at the forefront of this. They're the ones facing job losses, facing the loss of expertise um, from specialist correspondents, and facing increased pressures on a daily basis on the job as newsrooms shrink and increasingly journalists are asked to do more and more for the same amount of time and money. And then you get this narrative of crisis from scholars. Um, like myself, many journalism scholars come from the industry and a lot of them do come from print. And they come from a period where print was, when profits and money were plentiful in print. So you have this generational divide between a lot of journalism scholars who were in journalism at a time of plenty, facing a scenario where our students are graduating into an industry where they're facing scarcity and increased financial pressures. So the crisis is very much defined by an economic crisis. What's important here to consider is that, yes, while COVID has had a significant impact, it really is part of a long arch of decline in commercial media. This is from looking at US newspaper circulation and advertising share. The print newspaper took around 50 years to build up to the mass circulation that peaked in the middle of the 20th century around the 1950s. And since then, what we've seen is a slow decline, both in terms of circulation and in terms of revenue. The 1950s and 60s, what was significant there wasn't the internet. The internet wasn't around then. It was the competition from television. Radio had emerged in the 30s and 40s, but really it was television that emerged as a key competitor for the attentions of news audiences. And of course, it's been on the decline ever since. So when newspapers say, oh, it's Google's fault, it's Facebook's fault, they're not really revealing the full picture of what's going on because their industry has been in decline for over half a decade. That's not to say that new platforms have had an impact, but it wasn't as if suddenly because of Google and Facebook, there was a crisis in print newspapers. That has been a story of slow decline over the last 50 and more years. Ironically, when you look at the number of journalists employed over this time at newspapers in the US, even with declining circulations and declining um, profits, the number was relatively stable. But what's significant here is that we see this precipitous drop in 2008. And of course, we all know what happened in 2008, the financial crash that happened in Canada, US, and across the world. So what this tells us is that while print was facing a gradual decline, that decline was being managed. But when you have a sudden economic shock to the system, like the 2008 crash, this is something that journalism, as with other industries, just wasn't prepared for and didn't have the resilience to weather it without, in this case, cutting journalist jobs. In journalism, the most, your biggest expense is always people. You need people to gather the news, produce the news, publish the news, broadcast the news. That's your biggest expense. So it highlights when you have sudden shocks like the 2008 economic crisis, like we've had over the last two years, the COVID-19 pandemic, we really need a system of media 
that is resilient and sustainable to weather these economic shocks to the system. Of course, when we think of the media system today, it really is far more crowded and a busy space with intense competition for attention. And this is where journalism lives now. We're living in a media system where anything a journalist published is competing with 500 million tweets a day on Twitter. Any video produced by Global or CTV is competing with 300 million hours of video uploaded per minute. So it should be 300, so not 300 million. 300, oops, sorry. Let's get back. 300 hours of video uploaded to YouTube every minute. On Instagram, 95 million photos a day shared on Instagram. And then when you have on TikTok, which has been in the headlines recently, a billion monthly active users. So this is where journalism fits in, trying to catch the attention of people at a time when we've seen the rise of social media as a way for people to share, comment, and contest the news. So news, the media is now a shared space where journalists are one of the actors in this space. And so we've seen, for example, with Ukraine, headlines like this, the invasion of Ukraine becoming the latest major news event to play out on social media, with a lot of focus on the role of TikTok. Of course, Ukraine isn't the first conflict to play out on social media. We saw this during the Arab Spring with videos coming from Tunisia, but also from places like Egypt of young tech-savvy protesters sharing their narratives in English to a Western audience, using Facebook, using Twitter to organize their protests, to broadcast their footage, to amplify their narratives of resistance. Of course, in the 10 years since the Arab Spring, we've seen platforms geared far more for video, we've seen improved connectivity, and smartphones that have become better at capturing and streaming events in real time. So it's hardly surprising that we're seeing so much first-person video on social media from the people caught up in the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And social media is remarkably compelling. It has this aura of authenticity of providing this unfiltered view from people caught up in the news. Of course, the challenge is that when it's unfiltered, there's also the possibility of providing new channels to spread falsehoods and propaganda. And one of the things we've seen with Ukraine, as with other major conflicts, is an information war taking place on social media. So this video supposedly shows an uh, aerial dogfight over Ukraine. And it's supposed to be a Ukrainian pilot that was nicknamed the Ghost of Kyiv in a MiG-29 shooting down a Russian Sukhoi-35. Compelling video. Um, it went viral. In, it was posted in late February. In three weeks, had something like two million views. The only problem with a video like this is that um, it's basically too good to be true. It's simply not real. When PolitiFact, which is based at the Pointer Institute, fact-checked it, it found that this clip is not a dogfight in the skies of Ukraine. It's actually a clip from a free online video game called Digital Combat Simulator. But yet it looks very real and we want to believe when, when we see videos like this, that they're giving us this authentic, unfiltered view from the ground. Clearly, fake news is one of our major challenges in media, not just for journalists, but for all of us. But it speaks to how we need to be smart consumers of the news, especially when we look at how Canadians get their news and information nowadays. So it's hardly surprising that most Canadians rely on the internet, including social media, as their primary source of news. This is from 
the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at the University of Oxford, that do an annual report looking at news habits across the world. So 79% of Canadians say they get some of their news from online. I think what's significant here is that 55% is news from social media, which is very close to the news Canadians get from television. So we see here that essentially when we think about where Canadians are being informed, we're really looking at online TV and social media as the primary channels with print, as in print newspapers, not their online websites, really in decline. What's also significant is thinking about the device we access the news on online, especially because this then changes what we do and when we do it and how we do it. And again, here the story is one of the rise of the smartphone as the primary gateway for online news and for news on social media. Computer tailing off and tablet sort of hovering around the 20 something percent. Um, and when we think of mobile, when we have this little black slab that we carry with us, that means it changes when we get the news how we get the news, what news we get, what alerts pop up on our home screen telling us what is important, who controls the operating system in that phone that makes decisions on what is important to show us and what it won't show us. But it does change our habits in terms of how we use the news. So the, in 2017, Reuters did ask people, when you use your smartphone, how do you use it to get the news? And what we see here is that in 2017, half of online news consumers were using smartphones in bed to get the news, which is hardly surprising given how many of us sleep with a smartphone next to us. And when I ask students, what's the first thing they do in the morning? The answer I get overwhelmingly is always they pick up their phone becomes the first thing we do in the morning, the last thing we do at night. It also is a way that we're accessing the news when we're commuting, when we're taking public transit. Essentially, what the smartphone is doing is filling these gaps of dead time while we wait for a bus or wait for the SkyTrain or are taking that 10-minute commute to go downtown. We have time to fill, we reach for our smartphone. And news is part of that diet. The other thing it's doing, which is one of my favorite statistics, is a third of people who take their phone with them when they go to the bathroom. It's hardly surprising to see this. We used to reach for newspapers, magazines, or books, but now it's the smartphone. It's simply more convenient to pick up the device that is always with you, that is tailored to you, and that becomes essentially an extension of who you are, to paraphrase Marshall McLuhan. Now, Canadian journalists and Canadian journalism organizations are contending with these evolving media habits at a time when less than half of Canadians actually trust the news. This is Reuters asking Canadians about the levels of trust in the news, and in 2021, Overall, 45% of Canadians say they trust in news overall. Of course, it's much higher than news on social media, but in some ways it should be. It's news, it's what we do as journalists. We provide reliable, verifiable information to the public. But it's still a challenge when you think in terms of one in every two Canadians doesn't believe what they read in the media. And part of this becomes the challenge of who is this journalism for? Who does it represent? And who does it misrepresent? These are the questions addressed in a book by my UBC journalism colleagues, Candice Collison and Marilyn Young that I cannot recommend highly enough. Reckoning journalism limits and possibilities. And what they do in this book is they draw on five years of research with journalists in the US and in Canada. And they look at the long-term and long-standing representational harms caused by journalism. How journalism as an industry hasn't addressed matters of gender, 
of race, of intersectionality, of settler colonialism. The journalists should be thinking about questions of the inherent power relations in narrating what our present is, deciding what's relevant, who are the relevant and expert voices, as Candace raised in this interview. So Collison and Young argue in their book that the crisis in journalism is much more than about money. It's really a crisis of the harm caused to misrepresented and underserved communities. It's a crisis of who is journalism speaking for? Who is it supporting? Who is it promoting? And who is it marginalizing and diminishing? That is the crisis facing journalism now against the financial backdrop. Now into this gap, what we've seen are new digital born news outlets appearing in Canada and elsewhere that are seeking to repair some of this damage to reform what journalism is in Canada and who it's for. And this is really the focus of my research in progress with my colleague Marilyn Young at the Global Journalism Innovation Lab. This is a six year research project funded through a Shirk partnership grant. We have scholars at five different universities, journalists in six organizations, and our overarching theme is to try to understand how can we improve the supply, dissemination, and understanding of high caliber explanatory journalism that seeks to make sense of the world, that can be more representative. Um, part of my focus with Marilyn is looking really at innovation practices, business models, and the policy framework. And for this talk, what I'm drawing on is some of the research we've done looking at how new journalism outlets are seeking to address some of the big questions facing society, the climate emergency, racism, social justice, settler colonialism, and more. And for this, we looked to see what new digital born journalism organizations have been created in Canada since 2020. So over the past two decades and more. And what we found is that there's more than 100 English language ones that have started up, and many of them have this new mission, which include a critique of prior forms of journalism and a mission to try to improve the quality and the nature of journalism in Canada. So to give you some of the statistics here, we identified 107 digital born news outlets in Canada since 2000. Um, these are English language, we've excluded Francophone outlets, and our sample are new digital born organizations. So they're independent to some of the larger media conglomerates. What's remarkable with this data is that we really found two phases. There was some activity in the first decade of the millennium, but really most of the activity was since 2010, and a real increase in the activity of journalists seeking to create new outlets that respond to the demands of society since 2015. What's even most remarkable when we think about the discourse of economic crisis that we hear largely from commercial media is that most of these startups are still up and running in some shape or form. So we track that 15 overall have closed down. And you know, seven of those since the pandemic in the last two years, highlighting how things like COVID-19 can be a shock to the system, requiring more resilience and sustainability to weather it out. But most of our sample are still up and running in some shape or form, which is really quite remarkable when we look back and consider the discourses of economic crisis that we hear from commercial media. These new digital born news outlets are spread out across Canada. The largest number, about 45 of them, are out of Ontario, Canada's more, most populous province. But what's interesting here is that British Columbia is, has the second largest number of startups. So Ontario has 45, and in British Columbia, there are 35. So we do see that 
some of this is not confined to the big provinces like Ottawa, like Ontario and places like Ottawa and Toronto, but also spread across BC with some startups in the provinces, out on the East Coast, and in Yellowknife up in the North West Territories. But most of the activity happening in the two most populous Anglophone provinces. But I'd highlight here that these, the, these new journalism startups are not simply located in Toronto and Vancouver. They're also out, taking place outside of urban centers. And just to give you a sense of that, one of the first ones that we tracked was Castanet that was launched in Kelowna in the year 2000 um, as a way of providing local news. Then we have things like the Taiyi, which some of you may be familiar with, launched in Vancouver in 2003. So really a focus on local news, on provincial news. Some of the more recent entrants include the Sprawl, launched in Calgary in 2017, again, seeking to meet a need for local news that represents the community. And one that is due to launch next month in April is the Green Line, based in Toronto, looking at community news with a more millennial focus and a strong social justice agenda. So we do see that at a time when community newspapers are closing down or cutting back, there are signs of other outlets coming in to try to fill some of those gaps. And one of the key findings here when looking at these outlets is that even though many of them are commercial in nature, they effectively are non-profit commercial outlets in the sense that they don't really make money or make that much money beyond covering the operating costs. Instead, they are driven by a sense of mission. For the Taiyi, the values are truth-telling, justice, the environment, holding power accountable. Capital Daily in Victoria talking about independent journalism that tells community stories that are important to the community. One launching in Toronto soon, The Resolve, a BIPOC-led community-powered national platform for Black, Indigenous, and people of color voices and their stories. And what the resolve says in its mission statement is that efforts to diversify both legacy and independent newsrooms have largely failed. And they go on to say, Canadian media remains predominantly white, especially at the leadership level. This leaves Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities vastly underrepresented and their stories frequently misrepresented in the news. And then there's a handful of indigenous new journalism startups, including Media Indigena based in Winnipeg, an indigenous led podcast rooted in indigenous perspectives, its First Nations owned and operated. Now, one of the defining features of these new journalism operations that are driven by a sense of mission is that they are set up by journalists. So what we found is in, in the overall sample of more than 100 startups, two thirds of them were created by journalists. And they tended to be either more senior experienced journalists who were disillusioned with the direction of the industry and seeking to make a change, or by new emerging journalists starting in their, care in their careers looking to mainstream media and not seeing themselves and their communities represented in those outlets and then seek, seeking to create their own media outlets so they can improve and better represent the many communities that make up Canada. When journalists are founders, their mission is to serve community, to fix the news, address the legacies, of, of, address the failings of legacy journalism. They're not driven by profit. They're driven by a need to make enough money to cover the costs, pay decent salaries, and be able to keep on reporting. So they're not driven by a commercial profit imperative. They're driven by a mission to do better, more representative journalism. <laughs> 
Of course, none of this is without its challenges, and we could spend an hour discussing all of these. But among these signs of renewal and reinvention in journalism in Canada, we do see a series of challenges. A lot of these startups are run on a tiny budget and really in a precarious situation regarding funding. More than half of them are turning to their readers for some sort of revenue, from donations, from membership schemes, from crowdfunding. Um, they want to be, some of them take advertising, a lot of them want to be ad free and instead be a nonprofit relying on revenue from readers. The challenge here is that every media organization is turning to their readers as a way of funding. So that's a challenge for all these organizations. And the digital news report from Reuters says that only about 9% of Canadians, 10% of Canadians are willing to pay for the news. So there's a challenge in getting reader revenue and reader revenue consistent over a period of time. So you can build a sustainable, renewable news organization. In contrast to the US, Canada has a lack of a philanthropic tradition. In the US, most journalism nonprofits receive foundation funding. That's simply not the case in Canada. Only about 10% of our sample receive some form of foundation funding. And that includes the Conversation Canada launched by Marilyn and myself in 2017. Now, one of the few startups that re is receiving some foundation funding. The other two factors here are media concentration. Canada has one of the most concentrated media systems in the world. You know, Post Media owns 120 brands, national, community, specialty newspapers across print and online. Of course, they own here in Vancouver, both the Vancouver Sun and the province. So we have large media conglomerates that own large parts of the media and often are integrated with other services like telecoms and broadcasting and cable. And lastly is the question of media policy. What is the role of government here? What we've seen is the government responding to the cries of economic crisis by announcing $600 million in funding to help journalism over a course of five years or so. The challenge with this is that the initiatives so far have largely helped the larger institutional media. So there are things like digital subsidies for subscriptions and digital subsidies for reporters. But of course, this benefits larger media organizations with large number of subscribers or large newsrooms. So it's weighed heavily in favor of the larger institutional media and very little there to support an emerging new journalism organization that is trying to do something different to what big institutional media is doing. So while there are signs of resilience and signs of renewal, there's a pressing need to create structures to support independent journalism and media policies that help the development, launch longevity of new journalism outlets. Relying on precarious funding on donations really doesn't help to create a sustainable journalism system for Canada in the future. And that I think is the question I would leave, you, leave with you. We see that this activity is happening. I see this in my students that are full of ideas of how they can do better journalism. But how do we get to a system where innovation, where people seeking to right some of the wrongs of journalism are supported and can flourish in the media ecosystem in Canada. And with that, I'll open up to questions. Thank you very much. Before we go to questions, and I see that there are some, I want to thank you on behalf of the Emeritus College for this most informative talk this afternoon. You really have covered issues about the ruin of journalism and the, the challenges about 
providing informed evidence-based information when it's really needed badly. You've talked to us really about the decline of print and how the impact of television and other media has changed our lives. And you've really reflected data to support the changes, especially where smartphones are read. I think those three places, especially the bathroom, are quite interesting. And also about how the media sometimes does produce falsehoods and what that impact is for us, because we believe what we see, some of us, I think other people are more critical than me. So I think that that has been the sad part, but I think you're also, your discussion about the renewal, Canada's renewal and can, and what, how change can happen. I think that's really, really exciting. I know there are challenges, as you've said, and I believe also uh, the last thing you said about needing structures that support journalism systems, and that's really important. So I really thank you for your talk today, and now I am going to open this to questions. So the first question that I have is that the New York Times just said that they were wrong about Hunter Biden's laptops which might have helped Joe Biden win in 2020. What should we conclude from that admission about today's media reliability? Well, thank you, Sandra, for your kind words. Um, thank you, everybody, for uh, being here, and thank you for your questions. So in terms of reliability, the first thing I would say, journalists are not infallible. I always say to my journalism students, journalism is the art of the possible within the resources, time, and information you have available. It is always going to be a flawed product. Journalists try to make it as accurate and as evidence-based as they can, given the resources they have and the time they have. Um, but studies show that virtually every, you know, half, of journal, half of things published in journalism have, a, have an error. It could be somebody's title, it could be a misspelling, it could be age, or it could be something more serious. And one thing that struck me watching the coverage outside of Canada of the Ottawa protests, especially by the BBC, was they didn't seem to understand that health measures were a provincial mandate, not a government mandate. Mm -hmm. And I found myself sort of shouting at the radio saying, no, 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 Justin Trudeau cannot lift all mandates across Canada. That's not the way it works. You're misrepresenting the protests. Um, so this is not because journal, you know, journalists in the BBC are lazy or misinformed. It's just they're working with limited resources to a limited, within a limited times and have deadlines they have to meet. So you try to do your best and you may make a mistake. I think the important thing here and to go back to specifically the question, is to admit when you're wrong, to be really upfront with your audience and say, yep, we got that wrong. One of the changes I saw happening during my time at the BBC, when we moved to uh, you know, live reporting online, which we see now happening with Ukraine, with other big news events, is you know, as, as the news editor running the newsroom, having discussions with my journalists saying, do we publish this piece of information when we don't know whether it really is true or not? Mm -hmm. And you might assess, well, what's the impact if it's not true? And what's the impact if we don't publish it in terms of our audience talking about it on social media? Like, is it better for us to say, we have heard that a bomb has gone off, but we don't know about casualties and we don't know who was behind it and we don't know anything else and we're, we're on it. Like this kind of transparency with your audience that you as a journalist don't have all the answers and that you in some cases are seeing the same information they are on social media, but that what you're trying to do as a journalist is assess whether it's true or not and to provide the context of that information. So it's really important to admit when you, were, when you got things wrong. And sometimes at the BBC, we would say, well, you know that thing we reported an hour ago. It turns out it didn't. It wasn't really. Tr it wasn't true. Actually, what really happened was this, and we're sorry we got it wrong. But that's what police were saying at the time. Later, they changed their tune. Um, 
when Nancy Gifford, when Senator Gifford was shot, police were reporting she was dead because they said, well, they were reporting she was shot in the head. NPR took that as she is dead. Of course, she wasn't dead, she survived. But you can understand why at times of breaking news, you might make mistakes. The important thing here is to say when you are wrong and be open with your audience. I think one of the big changes we've seen in media is a shift away from the trust us with journalists, trust us with the New York Times, trust us with the Globe and Mail, trust us with CBC. Like implicitly, you should trust us because we're a media institution. Instead, moving towards earned trust, saying, you may trust us or not, but we will earn your trust. And sometimes that is admitting we got things wrong. Thank you. Next question, let me just go up here. When groups in society claim to be underrepresented, are they taking into consideration the percentage they are of that society? Interesting question. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think the question is flawed, honestly, because this is a question of if you do not see yourself in the media at all, when you have a media system that isn't just about representation, but also that essentially is geared up to the interests of white, male, usually upper middle class elites, then that media system is never going to represent you. It's not about percentages of um, these different communities in Canada. It really is about what is the story you're telling? And, you know, Herbert Gans, famous American sociologist, wrote in the 1970s how American media was basically white and male and promoted white male values throughout. So it's less a question of are they being represented in terms of numbers, but what are the values we're representing in the media? And if you have a predominance of white men in the newsroom, then you're gonna have a white, very male patriarchal agenda. Just by default, it, it'll simply come up because that is the lived experiences of the people in that newsroom. And what all studies show is that the more diverse a group you have working on a project, the more perspectives you have, the better the outcomes, simply because you're not trapped into the groupthink that tends to happen. And the challenge is to, even with gender, most newsrooms globally are dominated by men. There's very few women in positions of power. And then fewer than when you think in terms of women of color. But these are communities, when you look at a, 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 a city like Toronto, which is a large black community, how far is that black community represented in the leading media outlets in Toronto? Questionable. And here in Vancouver, how far is our Asian Canadian community represented in the Vancouver Sun, in the province, in their coverage, aside from stories about foreign investors driving up prices, which is a convenient myth to explain property prices in, in Vancouver. As you can tell, I have very strong feelings about this because you know, I, I mean, I'm in a classroom where half of our students are international. I see you know, many of them are women, many of them are of color, and they simply do not see themselves represented in the media, here or at home. Thank you. Another, um, question uh, or comment is uh, this person wrote that she de devised this um, a, this site up here um, as an upgrade for peer review in physics journal journalists and journals and she she wrote this on the chat what it is but I think it has wider applicability social media has replaced journal Social media has replaced journalism permanently, but likes are not enough. We need a, a net mechanism for evaluating credibility. So that's a comment. So, about thank this. you. Thank you for that comment. So I wouldn't say social media has replaced journalism. It's existing alongside journalism. And journalism has spent the best part of a decade 
trying to respond to, to social media and think about how to become part of that. Um, and part of that role is to help in terms of verifying information clearly. But part of that is also accepting that journalism is no longer a fortress. Journalism is no longer this fortress that only journalists are allowed to do journalism, mm -hmm. and that only journalists have the answer. Because chances are there is somebody smarter than you on social media that can help you figure something out. And you know, some of my research involved an NPR journalist called Andy Carvin. And during the Arab Spring, he reported on that from Washington, D.C. And through his network on social media, what he would do is he would say, oh, there's a tweet that says this bomb that was used in Libya is Russian. I, I, I'm not an expert in Russian ordinance. Can you on social media, my network, help me figure this out? And through the network, people would you know, provide information and be able to say, no, that's not a Russian shell. This is this kind of shell. So there are ways of doing this smartly. I think the major challenge for journalists and social media is that it's, it's a different beast to traditional media. It's one where you are one of many, you're one of a community. And it takes time to nurture and be part of that community. You can't parachute in, in and say, can somebody tell me this? Thank you, bye, I'm, I'll go away. Because you're not part of that community. You know, the best social media communities are work when people are invested in it. Reddit, which has a very bad reputation, mm -hmm. actually has a lot of very active, engaged communities with a lot of very good information because these communities are engaged and they police each other because they don't want somebody coming in and polluting that community with falsehoods. So we see both things happening. And in some ways, when it comes to fake news and falsehoods, the biggest culprits are politicians and other big actors like that. They're the ones who seed their state actors and politicians. So that gets picked up and amplified by people seeking information that reflects their beliefs. But it's much more complicated than just saying journalists, you know, social media has replaced journalism or journalists are the correct, the corrective factor in social media. It really is, a, it's a different ocean that we're swimming in. And, you know, journalists have only had 10 years to think and understand how to swim in this ocean. When, you know, print journalism has been around since the 1600s. So print journalism, we've had 500 years to sort out how we do print journalism. We've had almost 100 years of radio journalism and what, 70 years of TV journalism. We've had 10 years to figure out social media journalism. So it's hardly surprising that this is something that's still evolving. And the pace of these technologies, their uptake and devices we use them are advancing at, so, at such a fast rate. It's hardly surprising that we're stumbling through this, trying to make sense of how do we understand this new ocean we're in? Really interesting comments. Excellent. Next, interesting question as well. Has in-depth investigative journalism been especially hard hit by the financial problems of print media? The answer is unfortunately, yes. Mm -hmm. Simply because it takes time and it takes people, and you have to be willing to dedicate those resources. Now, it's, it's, it's still happening. It's happening at some of the larger media institutions like the CBC, the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star. But the other thing that we've seen um, developing over the last few years is increasingly partnerships between media organizations and universities and journalism schools to conduct some of these in-depth investigations. So at, at, the, at my school, my colleague, Peter Klein, runs a, a course in international reporting, set up a center in global reporting. And through the course in his center, our students take the course, they work an investigative project in partnership with a media company, the BBC, the Toronto Star, NBC. They often work because it's an international project with other journalism schools in the countries where they're studying. And so they work collaborative together on an investigative project that gets published then 
by the Star or by NBC or the BBC. Similarly in Concordia, they have a similar project where again, they work with journalism schools on an investigative project together with media, like um, they work with Global News and with Toronto Star to do these in-depth investigations, especially when you want to get a national perspective. You can see the advantage of working with journalism schools in Toronto, in Regina, in Vancouver, um, elsewhere to get more of a national perspective. But again, these are sort of operations where journalism schools and these collaborations are stepping into the gap for investigative journalism. Truth be told, investigative journalism is only a very small part of what actually happens in journalism. Most journalism is not investigative. It's day-to-day -day reporting of what's going on. It's chasing people to put on CBC News Network, it's chasing guests to put on the national. It's getting the tape in from Reuters or um, Associated Press to cut it in time for your bulletin tonight. Very little that happens is investigative. But investigative is the tip of the iceberg, which tends to get most of the attention and, of course, most of the awards. So we have, yes, it suffered, but it never was a major part of journalism in the first place. And there are efforts underway to try to make sure that it's not lost. Thank you. <laughs> Most interesting. Uh your answer to every question has been most interesting and informative. I'll continue because there are more. Uh, since 2020, the number of media outlets that reduced or ceased activity and the number of jobs uh, looked like large. But what were the base numbers prior to 2020? And then it goes on to, was 2020 another year like 2008 that marked an abrupt change or were the declines just a continuation of the pattern since 2008? So let me send you in the chat an article by um, a colleague of mine on our Global Journalism Innovation Project, looking at this very issue. And it, it's, 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 it's really challenging to think of the number of journalists because you have journalists that are employed full time, and then journalists who are part time, and then journalists who are freelance. So the number of, of journalists did rise from 87, 1987 to 2017. But since then, the number has been slowly going down, but not nearly by as much as we think. The change is less uh, the number of journalists employed in Canada, it's how they are employed. So it's the permanently employed number of journalists. That's what's changed. So what we see now is there are fewer journalists that are working for institutions and fewer journalists that are in permanent staff positions. That's the big change we've seen over the last five years. So increasingly a move towards contracts sometimes annual contracts that keep on being renewed or towards casual freelance labor where you bring in people as and when. So the issue facing you know, my students as they enter the workforce is less, will they be able to find work as a journalist and more, what kind of work will they be able to find? Will they be able to get security? Will they be able to get decent pay? Will they be able to get benefits with that? because they're entering a, an industry where casual contracts and short-term contracts have become much more prevalent than permanent staff positions with benefits. Good, thank you. Next, uh, David, this is the next question. David Beers, founding editor of the TAI, called for future-focused journalism writing that allows citizens to imagine and debate alternative futures and to mobilize support for the versions they support. Is this what media needs to do to be successful and appropriate? It's a really interesting question because mm -hmm. the TAI is very successful but has a very, very small audience. And that's one of the challenges with a lot of these new startups. Even when they've been around for almost two decades, they 
they don't they don't have the reach of something like global tv or the cbc now the question is is that because people prefer global tv to the tai it, it's hard to know because it's, it's it's a really difficult topic to research because you know i do a course in media innovation with my students and we always say to them when you're doing research for your projects don't ask audiences do you want more of solutions future focused journalism because everybody will say yes and if you say do you want better video on your phone they'll say yes and if you want more data on your phone you're going to say yes everybody will say yes to everything um certainly i think there's a need for journalism that goes beyond saying this happened yesterday and that goes beyond presenting the world as a series of wicked problems that you can't do anything about um and that's one of the major critiques of journalism that it's overly negative but also that it creates a sense of powerlessness in the audience and the effect that that is having and has had during covid is people turning off from the news news avoidance simply because it's yet another bad news story to make you feel bad about what's happening in the world without any sense of well what can i what either what can i do about it or what needs to be done about it so i think there's certainly a need for this future focused journalism figuring out who wants it if they want it and how they're going to get it is a very different question media habits tend to be formed as we grow up and so those media habits tend to stick with us through lifetime um yeah it's it's i don't have the answer here i certainly my students really are interested in doing journalism that tries to help people make sense of what's going on and help them understand what is happening to make things better as opposed to just it's another season of terrible wildfires in bc the planet's on fire and there's going to be no breathable air by the time you you're retiring that's not the journalism they want to do okay thank you well thank you all for excellent questions this has been a most informative afternoon and i think i can speak on behalf of all those who are attending that really provided us so much information and insight into all many aspects of journalism that i'm sure that we will digest and think about as we continue to watch and use the media or other parts of um, journalism, written, et cetera, as we continue to review them, hopefully more critically, as you said. So thank you. And um, I think the next that I am going to do is just share with you some upcoming events. Um, Mia, you're going to put that on screen for everybody just to review. Thank you. Okay, so you see that I know that Yost has gone over with you events that are happening, but especially to remind you about the annual general meeting with David Wilkinson and the Curac conference that's coming up. So we hope to see everybody at those events. So thank you all for joining us this afternoon.